Ladies and gentlemen, I came here this morning and I saw that uh, Peter and I were wearing suits that looked fairly similar, so I thought I'd better throw on a tie so that you could work out who the gentleman was and who the Kiwi was. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sure that... I'm sure that serve will be returned with interest. <laughs> I get the uh, last word. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I thought uh, I should always start with a little bit of a sales job in terms of uh, Anglo Gold Ashanti. For those that were looking at this wonderful photo, the centrepiece obviously being that wonderful shining dome, the Capitol building in Denver, obviously got your attention. Notice it's shining a little bit brighter than most of the domes in the US, in fact all of the domes in the US, and just to let you know that uh, last year we presented 70, 000, 70 ounces of gold to the governor to recover that dome. In fact, Cripple Creek Gold was used to cover that dome about 100 years ago, and uh, so consistent with the tradition, uh, we contributed another 70 ounces last year to cover the dome, so uh, very proud of uh, what we do in the community, and uh, I thought it was just a wonderful... Oh, yes, and that's the governor. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep a sense of humour. Ladies and gentlemen, my, my job today is to take the conversation that uh, Peter outlined and just provide you with a little bit more depth of detail in terms of how we set the context for the catalyst uh, conversations and uh, my colleagues will give you the real story in terms of those that sit a little bit outside the industry looking in. My job is to give you a view from inside the industry looking out and quite frankly the, the picture is not as attractive as we'd like it to be. First, just to give you a sense of the importance of mining, the mining industry in terms of society and I, I threw a few figures around at the uh, catalyst conversations and uh, I think people were a bit shocked uh, by the numbers so uh, I'll just share with you a few data points. Uh, one can argue some of the data points in respect of um, uh, contribution to the world's GDP. Very open to have those debates but uh, let me start with a few numbers. Firstly, direct mining activities, that is the revenues generated from the sale of uh, raw products or products taken to the point where they can be used in manufacturing processes represent 11.5% of the world's GDP. That's on a direct basis, so 11.5% of the world's GDP. If we then take service and support industries and some of the companies represented in this room would be in that category, Mining's contribution to GDP goes to 21% on a global basis. If we then think about the products of mining and how they're used across the globe, whether it be fuels in terms of transportation, energy, the lights, what we enjoy in terms of excuse me, heating, other products, the materials we use to purify water, literally almost every product that you're touching in this room has either been mined or grown. And in most cases now, it's generally mined. I had a discussion with someone yesterday and we talked about uh, steel pipes or copper pipes or stainless steel pipes. Well, let's go to uh, plastics. Well, in actual fact, much of the material used in plastics has been mined as well. So the mining industry is everywhere. In Thinking about the contributions we make to GDP, let me give you one very specific statistic. The use of fertilisers in the agricultural industry has over the last 100 years improved productivities by more than 100%. That is, we're producing double the product per square metre of ground under cultivation as a direct consequence of both fertilisers and the, and the mechanised methods we use in the, in the global agricultural industry. The agricultural industry produces about 15% of the world's carbon gases. Without the mining industry, it would be actually 30%. The direct contribution of the mining industry when we take direct business, indirect business, and its contribution to the major industries of the world, including construction, 
is more than 50% of the world's GDP hangs on the mining industry. And as Peter said today, the great threat for us all is, and at the moment we can't produce the products we require to continue to support the globe growth at 3%. And if that continues, and you've seen prices of commodities skyrocketing as a consequence of, of that supply demand or the demand supply gap, the problem's gonna get bigger. Even more frightening, in the next 10 years, as an industry, we will need to move 70% more material in open cast operations, and you would have seen the, the, the photos from uh, 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 the site visit. We'll need to move 70% more material just to get to the same amount of metals that we're getting to today. Underground operations will be on average mining 400 to 600 metres deeper than we're mining today. The mining industry's cost structures, and it, and it depends on the sector and the nature of mining, but on average are moving somewhere between 10 and 15% a year above community inflation rates. The cost of products from mining will more than double in the next five to 10 years. And for an industry that is absolutely critical in terms of 50% of the world's GDP, is absolutely critical to support the development of China, the development of India, the, develop, the development of Africa, is struggling to make its contribution today. In 10 years' time, that shortfall starts to move into catastrophic proportions. Now, there are potential solutions, innovation absolutely critical in terms of turning that around. But at the moment as an industry, we're not moving to address those issues in any real or sustainable way. And that was the starting point for us coming together and coming together as a team looking to try and create solutions. And what was most encouraging is NGOs, others with vested interest in terms of the the, the safe and sustainable development of society as a whole are starting to recognise that we haven't got the equation right. The question is how do we develop or how do we create a new model that provides us with a sustainable base in terms of developing our society. They are frightening numbers and quite frankly the people who were most surprised by those statistics were the people in the mining industry. That's the most frightening aspect of the conversations that we had. So many people came to me after the, after the presentation and said, I cannot believe those numbers. Where did you get them from? And I said, well, they're publicly available. The other thing that, that I did want to make a point about, and I had some uh, school kids, and we do a lot of work with school kids because we believe that education starts with education. And we talked about the f global footprint of the mining industry, and I'm not sure if people are aware, but the amount of area that we impact on an annual basis is less than, and, and considerably less than 1% of the Earth's surface is actually dedicated to mining activities. In terms of carbon gases, we actually generate less than 3% of the world's carbon gases. Yet in terms of the products we produce, we're reducing carbon gases by something like 20 to 30% through auto catalysts and through a whole range of other products that we produce, including fertilizers and improving productivity per meter actually cultivated across the globe. We use less than 1% of the world's water, yet the products we produce are actually adding to the available water supplies by more than 10%. And in fact, the mining industry is going to be critical to close that 40% gap that we have in the world today in terms of available water. We're absolutely critical in terms of society's orderly development, both in terms of economic development and in terms of the creation of a sustainable world. In our discussions, we came together and we, we talked about the four points, and I'm going to use four simple examples to give you a sense of why those points are so important. The first point, how do we define new technologies and mining methods that have the potential to deliver the products necessary to support the continued growth and development of the world as we know it? Can we turn a 0.2% allocation to R&D research into a game-changing 3%? At Anglo Gold Ashanti, we're mining the deepest 
mines in the world in South Africa, 4,000 metres below the Earth's surface. Has anybody been to Dubai and the Burj Khalifa, the tower? If you can remember what that looked like, if you can imagine five of those end to end, turn it upside down, that's how deep we're mining today in South Africa. That's where you'll get a sense of what we're doing. We're developing a new mining method that we think, and we've just started to do some testing underground, that will change the face of the mining and probably is the most significant change to the actual mining processes that we use underground, the most significant change in 100 years. The problem is the industry hasn't changed much in 100 years. The mining methods have been a, a little bit smarter, but they need to go a step change or we need to improve by a significant step change. The objective to, to double productivity is to halve costs, to eliminate fatalities because, and for those who remember my presentation four years ago, at Anglo Gold Ashanti, we had a fatality a week when we started four years ago. We've improved our safety performance by more than 70% and the commitment we made to the country is that we would turn the most dangerous mining industry in the world into a fatality free industry within 10 years and we're well on track to achieve that. But those changes in the mining methods are necessary. And what we've also worked out is that by using an open technology platform where we've actually opened our conversations to the world, we've been able to fast track the development of concepts in a period of less than two years in a world in which this sort of work would take probably more than 10 years. And the open technology platform is what we presented to the group for thought in the mining industry. We said no longer can we just do this and try and focus on creating a competitive advantage. If we don't share this and do this together, then as an industry, leadership will be taken out of our hands and the politicians will take over. And that's exactly what's happening today when you see super taxes, nationalisation of resource industries, an extraction or increasing extraction of resource rents from the industry in an industry that's blowing itself out of water in terms of its cost structures, we need to change the model. And if we don't do it, the politicians will. The second area of work was um, uh, the new development model. So not only have we alienated politicians and other members of the community, we've alienated our local development partners, provincial de de development partners, and obviously our federal colleagues. So we're looking at different ways of engaging local communities to create partnerships for development. We have a new project in the DRC. 40% of the capital that's going into that project will be about creating infrastructure for the community, whether it's energy to power the homes that have never had energy before. This is in the middle of the DRC. Fresh water, new infrastructure, commercial infrastructure, roads, a whole range of things that are dedicated to the community, health facilities and education. That's the sort of model that we believe is needed for us to create real partnerships at each level. That model is the one we were talking about in terms of that new development model for the industry. The third key area of work is education. In Africa, about 98% of people are actually working in rural environments. They've never seen an industrial process. So as a company, we've had to develop a whole new process off the Toyota model. We thought the Toyota manufacturing model was probably the best we'd seen in terms of start to finish, defining the way the operations work. We've introduced that in terms of our operations. We're helping people on basic education. Within three years, we're now starting to see young Tanzanians rise through the workforce and take up leadership roles in areas that we never thought possible. So a totally different way of working. And so how do we create new education models that address those skill requirements in Africa and then goes beyond in terms of new technologies? And finally, in terms of the fourth area, and this is my last point and I'll sit down, the total value chain. At the end of the day, the first thing we have to do as an industry is not only understand where value is created in terms of our business models, we have to help the community understand where value is created. And until we get that dialogue right, until people understand that 50% of the world's GDP is sitting on an industry that is struggling to come to terms, not only with society in general, but in terms of itself, then we're not going to be able to move this industry. We're not going to be able to deliver what society requires us to deliver for all of us to be successful in terms of where we go forward. With that, I'll hand over to my partners.